Cheryl Victorian. This is Waco PD on the beat. Whether it's crime or just getting to know the Waco Police Department, we're here to talk about things that matter most to you. Hello, I'm Officer AJ Smith, the Crime Stoppers Coordinator for McLennan County, and welcome to Episode 7 of Waco PD on the beat. And I'm Sierra Shipley, the Public Information Officer for the Waco Police Department. You know, this podcast, we're here to build relationships, engage the community, actively work to keep everyone safe and incorporate teachable moments for all. That's right. And on this episode, we've got our emergency communications manager, Susie, and we're going to talk about dispatch. Yes. The people that you don't see, but we wouldn't get to you if they weren't there. Absolutely. The ultimate first responder is what I like to say. Yeah, the first line first responder. Absolutely. So let's, uh, let's bring her on. All right. All right, so we have Susie Murray now here with Dispatch. She's yes. the Emergency Communications Manager. Yes. Thank you for being on our podcast. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So, so go ahead. I was going to say, that's a really big title, and I struggled with it at first. So <laughs> break it down for us. What does that mean? Basically, Dispatch. Dispatch and 911. That's, that's the area or the division within the department that I'm responsible for. Right. Now, you didn't start in Waco, though. You're actually fairly new with our department. Yes, I've been here since May, so um, just about five months or just under six months. So, um, But I'm not unfamiliar. I grew up um, born and raised in Mahaya, so um, I'm no stranger to the Waco area, but I am new here, definitely. Yeah, so what got you into, talk a little bit about your, uh, what got you into dispatch in, in the first place and where you started it all. So I got started 15 years ago, right out of high school in Mahaya. I needed a job. Um, dispatch was not on my radar. I had no intentions of ever becoming a dispatcher. I needed a job, fresh out of high school, um, getting ready to start school at MCC, and I needed a job. So... I applied because the police department was hiring, and I got hired on, and it's been over 15 years in the in its history. Nice. So, yeah. So you started in Mejia? I started in Mejia. I worked there for about two years while I was going to school at MCC, and when I um, got my associates there and had been toying with ideas of what I wanted to do next. Um, so I was applying everywhere for schools, and I got accepted to University of Houston downtown and had received a scholarship. So Houston became where I was going. And so I started applying um, to departments there and got on at a department there and moved to Houston. And that's where I've been for the last 13 years up until May when I moved here. So you came from Houston just like Chief. I did. I did not work for Houston Police Department. You worked for one of the other cities. But okay. I worked for one of the other cities um, and another agency um, within Houston. It's yes. still a small world. Yes. It's yeah. funny. I didn't know that. That's awesome. I like that. So why, I mean, like you said, dispatch wasn't on your radar. It, it kind of was just like, well, I need a job. Mm-hmm. So uh, when did you realize you fell in love with it? Uh, after I moved to Houston. So um, working at the police department um, in Mahaya got a chance to, you know, get the exposure. And it was like, okay, this is a pretty, pretty nice. I'm good at it. This could help me get to Houston um, to be able to, to secure a job. But after spending additional time in it while I was going to school, um, it just became one of those things where it's like, all right, I think I could, I think I could do this. And the agency that I was working for um, at the time, I had the opportunity to do more things outside of dispatch as well within the police department. And so I just really just kind of settled in and fell in love with the every day is something new. So there's never two days alike um, in dispatch or in the police department at all. Truth. So, <laughs> uh, so I got the opportunity to um, you know work in records. Um, I was an administrative assistant and um, also property and evidence. So I've gotten to touch many different areas within the police department. And so it's been nice. It's been nice, and I can't can't get away from it. (laughs) Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about our dispatch here at Waco PD. Um, 
we don't just have, I mean, we do have people sitting by the phone waiting for that 911 call, but that's yes. not all it is. No, it's not. Um, so a day in the life of a dispatcher here at Waco PD, um, we don't just support Waco PD. So we're also McLennan County Sheriff's Office, where they're dispatch. And then there are six other agencies within the county that do not have their own. So there's uh, Bruceville Eddy, there's Moody, there's Mart, there's Riesel, there's Crawford, and there's West. So we're also their dispatchers and 14 volunteer fire departments within McLennan County. And so we support all of those agencies. And we may not be taking a 911 call every minute of the day, but there's the administrative line for City of Waco, PD, and McLennan County, and the other cities that we're supporting. So we're taking hundreds of calls. I mean, actually, we average about just under 1,100 calls a day. Wow. 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 That, that's a real big number. If my phone yeah. rang 1,100 times in a day, I think I'd throw it out a window. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you guys didn't have enough people. I mean, you obviously have enough, but you didn't have adequate staffing, but 1,100 calls. How many people work up there to answer those 1,100 calls right now? Um, on a good day, we could have anywhere from five to seven. Um, we have several vacancies. Um, so we could have anywhere from five to seven. That typically includes a supervisor as well. That's a lot of calls per person per day. Yes. That's and not everyone has a phone um, because of the uh, two of the primary channels. Uh, they're focused strictly on the officers. So. Crime Stoppers is an organization which bridges the gap between law enforcement and the community so together we can solve crimes in our neighborhoods. Crime Stoppers encourages the community to assist in the fight against crime by overcoming the two key elements which inhibit community involvement, fear and apathy. Crime Stoppers allow citizens to anonymously submit tips. Tips can get you up to a $2,000 reward if it leads to an arrest or solves a crime. Tips can be submitted by calling 254 753 H-E-L-P, which is 4357, visiting wacocrimestoppers.org or downloading the P3 app. Remember, tip submission is always anonymous and can lead to a reward of up to $2,000. Right, right. So talk about those primary channels. So we answer those 911 calls. Mm -hmm. We have the fire department. We also dispatch for our officers. So talk yes. about what that means, that, that, that uh, officer and dispatcher relationship. What is that? Um, so... Sometimes the call is initiated by the officer and sometimes it's initiated by um, some, a citizen in the public. So we either get a non-emergency call or a 911 call. Sometimes we get emergency calls on the non-emergency line um, and we get non-emergency calls on 911. But either way, someone calls and they tell us that they need assistance. Um, we enter their address and we have a series of questions that we're going to ask. Um, we enter that into what our CAD system or uh, com computer aided dispatch. Um, and that information gets logged in. And then the dispatcher that's responsible for dispatching based on the address. So we have two primary radio channels we have Waco Primary and we have the SO or the Sheriff's Office Primary. And that covers the Sheriff's Office and the other agencies that we support and based on the address determines which dispatcher it goes to. And they see the information that the call taker put in and based on either location or beat, they'll dispatch the officer that needs to respond to that call. So talk about that, you know, like kind of, I said in the beginning, uh, before you came on that those, those dispatchers, they are the first person that's going to answer that call for help. They are the first, first responder. Literally. Absolutely. So explain, though, how important it is for that dispatcher to be there, not only for the caller, but for our officer, too, because our officers don't know what they're getting into. Absolutely. So dispatch, we, we are the eyes and the ears for the officers until they're able to make scene. So they're relying on us to get good information, um, accurate information and to get it quickly so when someone calls in we're asking in addition to their location because that's the primary piece of information that we need all the other stuff is secondary to location because we can know everything but if we don't know where you are we can't get you help so you know we ask for your location and we're asking you know what's what's going on or we're listening to the context clues in the background is the call or whispering um, is there a lot of commotion in the background um, 
we're asking about weapons because that's a major officer safety and a public safety issue, especially if you're taking into account if it's a school or they're in a park, they're in a grocery store, and there's lots of people. You know, how many people are involved? Descriptions. I mean, if you think of, if you go in Walmart on the weekend and someone says a fight broke out, how many people are in Walmart at any given time? Yeah. So, you know, we're asking for, you know, descriptions of the persons involved. We're asking for descriptions of vehicles involved so that way we can get that information to the officer so that way they can better assess um, what they're getting into before they get there. Yeah, absolutely. And so that's a lot of information the dispatcher has to remember. Is that something that just comes naturally after a while? Is, or is there a, a, a list that the new people get to make sure they're <laughs> asking those specific questions? Because I feel like I'd be like, oh, I forgot to ask about this and this. <laughs> uh, so in training, yes. They're, um, they were, they're given scenarios and they're able to um, walk through in a controlled environment the call process and how what questions need to be asked based on the information that you get from the initial call. But again, um, like you mentioned, does it come naturally? And after a while, yes. So the, the longer you've been in the job, there are just some things that you can hear certain things in a call to know that I hear what the caller is saying, but I also hear what they're not saying. And you're able to, you know, discern and see, okay, I think this is more appropriate or change your line of questioning to try to get that information out of the caller. Yeah, and I know sometimes you guys have a really hard job because like someone's on the phone and they're just yelling at you because they want the police there and you're trying to figure out, okay, where are you so that I can get officers to you? Right. So like, you know, if if you call 911, like at least tell them where you are so that they can get us started and then they can try to pry those questions out of you. But I, I mean, I know I was guilty of it sometimes getting frustrated. It's like, how do you not have more information than this? But I, yeah. you know, after the call is done, I'm like, okay, I'm sorry because. <laughs> Come spend yeah, some time with us. <laughs> I've gone up there a few times. So I know. So I shouldn't have gotten mad in the first place, but it happens. We're all human. Mm -hmm. Right. I it mean, does. there's only so much you can have over radio communication. Yes. Yeah. We want to keep it concise and, and want to be controlled and. Um, when we were speaking on the radio because there are numerous officers on those same radio channels. So we don't want to tie up the radio um, if we don't have to with unnecessary information or um, or minor details, you know, depending on, you know, what the situation calls for. Because another officer in another part of town could be in a storm and, you know, in a fight or a major situation. And if we're just constantly talking on the radio, it makes it hard for them to be able to get through. Right. Talk about that training. As you said, you said that we talked, you spoke a little bit about that training in the controlled environment, but talk about how much training goes into becoming a dispatcher. The on the job training itself, at least for here, yeah, we're looking at almost a year because we have, um, there are four radio channels that a dispatcher must clear um, and call take. So there are five essential um, pieces of the job that they have to train on and be able to clear in order to work it. So it, it takes a while and that's in, dish, in addition to the classroom training. And that's also in addition to the state mandated training because dispatchers are licensed through TCO or the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement. And so um, we're held to a standard. So you have to be able to obtain a license. And we have one year from the date of hire to get you licensed with TCO in order for you to continue to operate as a dispatcher. Um, and that in itself is an 80 hour course um, that we have to get new hires in who aren't already licensed in. And then they have to pass the state exam in order to actually obtain their license. Absolutely, because I'm sure there's a lot of information that our dispatchers receive that shouldn't necessarily be public knowledge. Absolutely. Absolutely. I just took that class. That I mean, and I only took <laughs> half part of the class. I'm surprised you still have hair. I was ripping mine out. <laughs> oh, and then you have to pass a test. I hate those emails. And if you don't pass the test, then you have to retake it. Mm -hmm. But you have to wait 24 hours. 
I passed. I was, I was going to say, still. I didn't know that. I've never failed. <laughs> I, I've made it my goal. I got um, but I, I do, I do uh, give give props to those dispatchers up there. When, when The first time I went up there, coming as, from a civilian, not knowing really anything about police work and coming up there and hearing you for the first time saying, oh, we don't just do Waco PD. We do all these different agencies. I, I mean, my mind was just blown. I, that job is stressful. It is. It is. I mean, there's there's no there's no easy way to put it. It's no sugarcoating it. It is a stressful job, emotionally, mentally, and even physically because it's sedentary. So we're sitting um, twelve hours a day. Yeah, because I mean, the dispatch it's staffed twenty four hours. There, hours. there is not a moment where that room is empty. Not ever. So and, and explain seems so silly to be like oh. Okay, this question, but why 24 hours? Because criminals don't take, <laughs> they don't take off emergencies. Um, people have medical emergencies. There are disputes, there's disturbances. Life continues on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And so we can't predict when someone's going to have an emergency where they need police or fire or EMS. So we have to be there ready and waiting for that call essentially even during the snow apocalypse were you here for that no so i came in may so okay you missed <laughs> it. That's right after yeah yeah after. so i i missed it here experienced it there in houston but i i missed it here oh man i could only imagine what that room was like during that time oh my goodness I, explain you know a dispatcher has to be really calm on the phone yes how important is that to have that you know, some, like you said, people are calling 911 in the police, not because something great's happening. Right. When we hear from people, <clears throat> hey, I'm having a good day. No, that doesn't happen. Um, they're, usually it's like one of the worst days of, you know, of their lives. So yeah. um, they're hysterical, even belligerent at times. Um, but we have to remain calm because if you have two people that are heated and angry or frustrated, trying to, you're not going to solve anything. So we have to, you know, take a step back, take the role and of the calm one and neutralize or de-escalate the situation as much as we can over the phone. Um, one, it gets us the information that we need. And secondly, so that way, hopefully by the time the officers show up that the situation has de-escalated or diffused enough to where they can effectively do their job. And talk about, too, you know, we, we talked about dispatcher-officer relationship and also the person calling in and the dispatcher. But what about just the team in general? What, what, what is that relationship like between the teams? It's pretty cool. So you have, you have different dynamics. I mean, we have people of um, every age. Um, you have different cultural and ethnic and racial backgrounds. So it's, you know, it's a good mix of people. And, I mean, we're we all have this one thing in common, dispatch. Um, and we have people that have been there less than a year, and we have people that have been there 35, so 35 years. So, uh, yeah, so you have those multi-generational, and it's, it's pretty cool to just watch um, everyone interact with each other to serve, you know, McLennan County. Yeah, all at the same end goal. <laughs> at the same, yeah, we all have the same end goal. And feeding off, you know, off of each other and um, helping each other out in, in different areas. And so it's, it's pretty nice. Yeah. Now you're hiring. Yes. Right. Let's yes. talk about that. What, what can people do to uh, work in dispatch? First, they'll need to go to the city's website, <laughs> fill out the you know, city's um, application. Uh, once they get the application and embedded for the minimum hiring criteria for the city, it's forward over um, to me to take a look at. And, you know, we look it over and then we start with the personnel office, start processing it, um, making contact. Um, the biggest part that we have with the hiring is the personal history statement. Because of the job and the licensing requirements and with t -Cole, there's this huge packet that has to be filled out because there it has to be a background investigation because of the job and the information that we have access to that in can't just allow anyone to come in so there is a background investigation to make sure that you're a, um, 
a good candidate for the job. And so that's a big part of it. Um, beyond that, there's a polygraph because we need people with integrity. Um, so there's a polygraph and then there's, the, there's a psych evaluation and of course a drug screen and physical. So uh, you said, well then once you're hired, there's almost a year of training. Yes. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So the dispatch, I guess, academy, do you contract through MCC like the police academy does, or is that all in-house for Waco? So uh, right now, we're actually going through TEKS okay. um, because they have their dispatch um, licensing program online. Okay. And with our staffing levels right now, um, to send someone away for a month to go through the dispatch academy and MCC yeah. can can be pretty, pretty tough on us. But the online component, and it takes about – two weeks for them to complete. It's an 80 hour course that okay. they're able to complete online, which it helps because there's different times if we have those periods where we have the extra staffing, then it's allowing having that person to go sit in our training room and work on it. Um, and it really doesn't disrupt everything that we, you know, have going as far as staffing. That's good. Cause it lets them already be there and start becoming a part of the team, which yes. probably helps throw you guys together yes that exposure to the job um is a good thing for new people that have never done the job before to kind of see what's it like um as they're doing the training it i think it helps for it to stick better yeah. when, when new people start what's probably the biggest thing they say that they're like oh i didn't realize that this is what this all entails what's the biggest thing that kind of shocks them Sometimes I think it's the call volume. It's the it's the call volume. Eleven hundred. <laughs> <laughs> I still can't get past that number. That's just crazy. Because when the phones start ringing, they're ringing, and it doesn't stop for a while. I mean, you can literally be on the phone um, on nine one one, and there's another nine one one call pending, and there's the admin lines that are pending, and then there's the sheriff's office lines that are <clears throat> coming through and having to prioritize with answering all of you know all of those calls. Right, right. So kind of paint the picture because we we we've spoken this up in like kind of broken pieces. So we've got a big room and mm -hmm. we've got maybe five to six workers at a time. Yep. So explain who is sitting where. And who's who's manning what station and how many okay. are manning that station? Um, so on the entire floor, because um, also Waco Fire Dispatch shares our, our workspace. So they're on the floor with us. And also the AMR, um, EMS Medical Dispatchers, um, they're there as well. So it's one huge room um, that all three entities are, are sharing. And so when you come into our area, you have our... You know, EMS, and you have Waco Fire, and then across the room is where we're sitting, and we have four call take stations set up, Then these stations, they're only taking calls. That's, that's what they're doing. And then um, just over the aisle, there are, um, in a circle, there's four radios, and one right outside of the radio. So we have uh, the Waco Primary, uh, which is Channel A, and we have... Um, our secondary B, and then just outside we have the C, and then we have the SO channel, and then we have the backup um, SO radio channel. Very good. So there's a lot of communication. There's a lot of noise that's just going on in that room. Always. In general. Always. I mean, how hard is it? Because sometimes when I'm doing something and someone's talking to me, but there's radio playing in the background or TV playing in the background, I'm like, <laughs> hold on. I have to turn this off so I can pay attention to you because there's too much noise. <laughs> it takes a special skill. Um, so funny story. Growing up, I've always been a multitasker. Didn't pay any, ever pay any attention to it. But... Um, I could be sitting in my room and I could be working on my homework, but I could also have the TV and the radio playing. And I know what is going on. I'm focused in on my work, but I also know what's playing on the TV and I know where the song is and, I, and all of that. And it, and it meshed well. So um, growing up, my brother would always make fun of me for listening today. He would say, He'd come in and turn the TV off or turn. I'm like, hey, what are you doing? He was like, you weren't listening. I'm like, yes, I was. And he was like, you know, only crazy people do that. <laughs> 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 and 
And he would tell me, you know, one day you're going to get a check for that. <laughs> Look who, at you now. And who knew? Awesome. <laughs> 15 years later. Uh, and I've been a dispatcher for the last 15 years where that, you know, those skills came come in handy day in, day out. Um, you know, even my husband, he um, pokes fun at me because we'll go anywhere and we're talking, but I I have room awareness with my ears where I I can hear what's going on all around me. And But it's just one of those things that is, we call it a dispatcher ear because you have to be able to, um, the person who's working the primary radio channel, granted, that is their primary focus, but also that room awareness to know what's happening on this channel, what's happening on that channel, and even the call taker that's sitting across the room, that they're listening to those questions that they're asking and those things that they're repeating back to the caller to pick up on like, oh, this is going to be this is going to be a hot call that they're preparing for. And they're not even sitting as close as the three of us are sitting and they're picking up. So, I mean, it's it's a skill that is definitely needed for anyone that would want to do the job because you have to be able to pay attention to multiple things and be able to respond uh, appropriately to them. Yeah, it's like having been up there and I know how hard it is for me to hear the B radio. Like on our little tour, we sat and listened to the B radio. I'm like, like I can't hear anything. I'm putting my ears close to the computer as I can. And then to know that when I'm on patrol and whoever's on A says, I'm 10-4 on your B traffic, it, like acknowledging the fact that they heard what I said on channel B, I'm mm-hmm. like, how? Because you're like 10 feet away, and I couldn't hear it with my face on the computer screen. <laughs> so it is impressive. And then, you know, knowing that the call takers are able to do the same thing, they're 25 feet away. Like, mm-hmm. that is really impressive to do because, you know, my wife makes fun of me all the time. I go to eat with her. I've got my earpiece in, and I just zone out because I've got to focus on what you guys are telling me because I feel like that's pretty important. And then I just stop listening to her and I stop listening and eavesdropping on the tables around us. Like I've been doing the whole meal. Or eavesdropping. I could see you being with your husband and then you're just talking to him and you're going, wait a minute, did you hear what they said? No, I did not hear what they said. Right. Do you want to help solve crime in your neighborhood? Well, the Neighborhood Camera Initiative is something you might want to sign up for. Ring doorbells, nest cameras, and all the other camera security systems installed on homes and businesses that are facing public areas are tools that could help our officers solve very important crimes. By signing up your camera or cameras in the Neighborhood Camera Initiative, it allows our officers' knowledge to where these cameras are, and if a crime had happened, it could have possibly saw the incident in question. You can sign up your camera on the City of Waco website at wacopolice.com. I mean, that's definitely, like you said, a very important skill and a certain type of person. I mean, why do you like the job so much? Um, I like the variety, the, the the change of pace daily. You have absolutely no idea what you're going to walk into when you walk through those doors on a Monday morning or a Thursday night. And you, you have absolutely no idea. It, it literally changes. And it changes within the day, within the shift, that moment to moment is like, okay. So I like that part. Um, and I also like helping. And this is a, um, a unique way to be able to serve others in a way that a lot of people probably wouldn't, wouldn't think about because we – we are literally serving others day in, day out, whether it's the officers or the citizens. That's that's what we do. Our job is literally there to, to help others, and that's what we do for the entire entire day, 24-7. I mean, everybody talks about how us as the officers serve the community, but we wouldn't show up. We wouldn't know where to go or be able to do anything if you guys weren't there to mm-hmm. take those calls and then send the information to us and – you know, as we're going there, getting us more information so we at least have a little bit of an idea what we're going to. Yeah. Right. And it's kind of an instantaneous thing because, and maybe I'm, I'm wrong, but you tell me, when the call comes in, uh, that dispatcher is typing information into the computer. Mm-hmm. Is the officer seeing that information being typed in as well? Or how does that, you know, how quickly is that information sent? Oh, those calls, they can go to the office computer literally within seconds. Um 
especially as far as talking about the room awareness. So just because the A dispatcher isn't the one taking the call, but he or she is listening to the room and they're having a good idea of what's happening. So that dispatcher is able to see as the call taker is entering those notes. So we're not necessarily waiting until the call is has ended before it's sent over. I mean, no sooner that we put in the address and designate the call type, the A dispatch, they're seeing all of that, I mean, live as, as it's occurring. And so because they have the room awareness and they're paying attention, they automatically know who they're who they need to send based on the address. And then once they assign that officer to that call, then they're seeing that information. Yeah. And like I haven't been in the room when it's happened, but I've heard the communication on the radio where like the A dispatcher knows something's coming in. It hasn't been created yet. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've got all officers on a call. Somebody clears. We've got something pending that's a low priority. And the guy's like, hey, you know, I'll take this because I'm nearby. And the A dispatcher's like, well, stand by. We've got a high priority call coming in and mm -hmm. I'm fixing to get the information to send you. So you guys just work together so well. And we have to. It, it yeah, just we have to. It serves the community in such a great capacity. Yeah, the best communicators, I know, <laughs> for <laughs> sure, for sure. Um, and and there is, you know, you know when you're in a theater and they say, you know, don't say good luck. <laughs> She's already getting, yes. or we're not in the room. I feel like we should, we, we can maybe say it, maybe we say it. Sure is quiet. <laughs> Thanks, AJ. <laughs> um, you do not say that word in dispatch. You do not say. Sh <laughs> so we'll get chased quiet. out, told to leave and to not ever return. Yeah, um, <laughs> you'd have to fortify the basement now. <laughs> um, yeah, that that is one of those words that you do not. And of course, it's typically purely coincidence, but it just never fails that if, as soon as someone says, oh, it sure is a quiet day, that is like the sky just yeah. breaks and everything that you could imagine happens and yeah full moons too like i thought somebody was playing with me my first couple of months mm -hmm. on but like i definitely noticed that when there is a full moon about to happen it starts getting crazy and when there is a full moon there is something just ridiculous that night oh so i'm not yes. in the words of michael scott i'm not superstitious but i right. am a little stitious <laughs> i at least believe in full moons and the chaos that follows yeah that correlation just it happens enough to where it's like okay you you start to associate the full moon with the craziness or saying the word quiet with yeah so those are things that yeah you don't yeah know. right right no no and then i have to remind myself too when i if i ever go up and dispatch because sometimes i go up there and like oh hunt's real busy i don't even want to ask any questions i'm just gonna sit here and stay <laughs> not, <laughs> not talk and it's fine and then other times i'm like oh that's quite, don't say that mm -hmm. don't mm -hmm. say that don't say that mm -hmm. <laughs> So, because then when it's not quiet for you, it's not quiet for anyone at the department. Right. Yeah. It's so, trickle down. Yes. It, it does start. Yes. It's a little crazy for you guys, and then it gets really crazy. And then on the way to the crazy call, oh, there's a wreck in front of me. Right. Oh, that's a bad wreck. So, just, that's how it always happens, mm -hmm. too. Yeah. It just spirals. Goodness, goodness. Yeah. So, how, I mean, because. Like you said, people are calling when it's the worst possible moment in, in their life. How hard is it to have to sit there and listen and then be done with that call and kind of because you guys aren't really there for the end of the situation? No, no, not especially the ones who are taking calls. So the call takers, I mean, you literally just listen to someone um, and maybe they found a loved one that was deceased or, you know, something of that nature that it's a really emotional and you're talking to them, you're getting information and then you disconnect, you know, and you're on to the, the phone is ringing. So there is no time to process that call, in, you know, internally to, huh, I want it's on to the next call. And before you know it, you've taken another 20 calls since that call and it just is part of the law for the day that hey these this is one of the calls that I you know that I had um and it doesn't mean that it doesn't impact you um emotionally that it's you know some throughout the day hmm, I wonder what happened with that or I wonder how that person is you know is doing you may have those thoughts 
But because of the the volume of calls that we're receiving, it's just we're on we're on to the next thing because they're having to give that same kind of support or a different kind of support to another person that's having another type of crisis or um, or a bad situation. Um, someone whose child has ran away or their child is missing, didn't return home. Um, someone vehicle that was stolen or broken into, you know, so those things are happening. And so um, emergencies are different for every person. And every person responds differently. And we have to, you know, flip our switches constantly to sometimes we have to be firm and control the call because we're not getting anywhere with callers. They're not getting in. So we're, you know, having to, you know, man, we need this information. This is what I need from you. You need us, you know, you need to provide us. We need the address. Last time that, you know, this was all the description, all of this. And then there are those other calls where, we have to just, you know, take a step back and we so- soften our tone and um, we do a lot of listening um, and we interject where we can because the call calls for that. So um, we we wear multiple hats and and have to balance our feelings and emotions when we're taking those calls um, because they do have, you know, an impact on you um, and they sit with you um, not even just for the day, but years to come. I can remember some pretty significant calls I've taken over the years that they, they don't just go away, but they, they linger. Yeah. I mean, the way it was explained to me in some, some of the crisis intervention training I've been to is like the officers get closer. Like we get there, it's crazy. But then by the time we're leaving, we've at least figured something out. Things Mm -hmm. have calmed down. So we get that like natural, decline of our emotion what are some things that like the officers listening to this can potentially do like would it help if the officers came up and talked to you like if there's a crazy call they came up and were like hey like this is how it started this is what we kind of concluded with is that something that would help is that something that we should try to do I think that's something that could definitely help because sometimes we're just sitting there just waiting for the pieces to come together like hey they still out on that call yeah. You know, I wonder what's what's happened with that. Oh, excuse me. But um yeah, those kinds of things could definitely help um because it just gives us that extra piece that cuz we know how it started. Yeah. Yeah, so we we get all of that um but the conclusion is what is what we miss. Sometimes the middle um and the conclusion is what we miss with those calls. Especially with some of the ones that like come to you as utter chaos. We show up and we're like this is like your hot water didn't turn on. Yes. Ten eight yes. report. Yes. So yes. I guess especially on those, we could probably do a lot better job <laughs> of at least saying like maybe not tying up the primary channel, but ten eight no report and then sending you a message and saying, yeah. Hey, like the cat was stuck in the fence and that's a fire department call or right. something. So but sometimes that happened. We will get those hysterical callers yeah. and they will report and say one thing to us on the phone and then officers show up. And they're like, dispatch, there is no, that's, like, right. that's not. Right. That and you guys aren't making it up, but right. you also can't, you know, you can't tell the caller, are you sure? Right. You have to take everything yeah. we take say. every We take every call serious because we, we don't know. We absolutely don't know. We are relying on what that caller um, is telling us. And sometimes there are calls that, you know, it's like, this is strange, but it was just a strange a strange call, you know, a strange set of circumstances. Um, and then sometimes the call doesn't always play out the way that um, we think it does, but it doesn't mean that we have, that we give it a, you know, a lower priority that what you tell us, we're going to ask those vetting questions to uh, as much as we can for the, that's appropriate for the situation to let the officer know that, um, Hey, here's, this is what we got. And the officer show up and, Either it was one of those strange calls or, okay, like he said, no, it wasn't, it wasn't that um, significant of what, you know, of what we received. And it's like, okay. 
I think no matter the call, and I think Miss Ellie was the one that was telling me about this. She's one of your dispatchers, mm-hmm. and she's been there a long time, 20 years? 20, about 24, 25 years. Okay, okay. And so she was saying that, you know, no matter the call, she's going to give her 110%. Absolutely. Absolutely, you know, as much as she can do, just so it's kind of a closure thing for her, so she knows that she did all she could. Yes until that officer got there to, to fix that situation. Yes. And I think that goes with, I guess, helping you guys work through that uh, mm-hmm. call, whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. What would you tell someone who's thinking about being a dispatcher? How would you maybe get someone or convince someone to be a dispatcher? What would you tell them? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> um, if you like to problem solve, because we do a lot of problem solving, you know, think about it in terms of um, – because there's this misconception that dispatchers that, you know, we're like the department receptionist that, you know, we answer the phone and who would you like to speak with? And we transfer them and then that's it. But there's so much more to what we're doing um, that, you know, we're putting the, you know, p- pieces together um, for, you know, our job and what the officers have to do. And so if you like to problem solve, um, if you have heart and you have integrity, um and you have the capability to help others that are in crisis because that's what we're dealing with. Uh, granted, there are some calls that are light and, you know, and there's like it doesn't take um, a lot of emotional, um, what's the word I'm trying to say? Um, it doesn't take a lot of emotional strength to deal with. But when we have those calls, you have to be prepared emotionally. So someone who is emotionally sound, you know, stable, that have that core, that they could deal with others calling and having issues and that they can process it and do what needs to be done. Um, And it won't necessarily, um, I guess, maybe tire them out. And I'm not talking like, oh, my gosh, just another one of these calls, but just... Can you deal with that constant of uh, emotional uh, style of calls coming in and be able to process each one of them the same way you process the first one? And just not get like emotionally vested in everything because mm-hmm. that would just completely wear you out, I'm sure. It would. I mean, <clears throat> it really would because it takes a lot. Um, it takes a lot of emotional strength to do the job, um, and if you are emotionally invested in every single call that comes through, um, it will make it difficult to, you know, be able to stay in the job long term. Um, And it doesn't mean that you don't have those ones that stick with you, um, but, yeah, you can't become emotionally invested in every single call. You have to um, follow the protocols, get the information that you need, um, serve with compassion and empathy and sympathy, um, do all of those things. Um, and then we're on, you're on to the next one. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Anything else you want to say, talk about, we want to reiterate again that you guys are hiring. Yes, we are. If you feel like you could be a dispatcher, even just going through the interview process, if maybe you're still not sure, just go ahead and apply. You never know what might happen. You never know. You could, you know, be like me that ended up in it and you loved it and you couldn't get, in, you know, can't get away from it. Exactly. I was about to say that. I, I did the job for interview practice. And when they said I got hired, I was like, oh, all right. And then <laughs> here we are, like almost five years later. Yeah. Loving it. So. Yeah. Because you, you just never know. There, This could be someone's niche and they just don't know it. Um, because there are those people, not everyone that we hire has previous experience. There are people that we hire that have never done the job before. Um, and they turn out to be great ones. I mean, over the years with, um, hiring people, I've seen people with no knowledge, no background in it come in and they blow you out of the water. So, um, try it out, come in, apply, um, and you may get in here and love it because if, if you're receptive to training and and criticism, but you have integrity and heart, because those are things we can't train for. Yeah, I, We can't train for integrity. We can't train for heart. But we can train you to use the radio, to answer the phones, to use the computer system. But if you have it here and you have it here already, 
I mean, those those are the qualities and those are the characteristics that we're looking for with with people. Integrity and, you know, heart and commitment and dedication, those things that you can't train for. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Susie. We appreciate your time. That is all of uh, what we got now for episode seven, I think we're on now. Seven. Yeah, of Waco PD on the beat. I'm Sierra Shipley, the public information officer. And I'm Officer AJ Smith, the Crime Stoppers Coordinator for McClendon County. Have a good one, Waco. Waco PD on the beat. The heartbeat serving you.